everyone. Welcome to episode 26 of Enforcer and the Dude. For anyone that's new to this show, I'm Russell Ingle, supercars driver. Well, <laughs> You're back. Uh, only for one race anyway, but the biggest race of the year, the one that counts, the super cheap auto Bathurst 1000. It's still known as that, isn't it? No, it's uh, another automotive brand. Nah, to me it's still the super <laughs> cheap auto Bathurst, mate, so don't worry about that. And to my left, your right, is Paul Morris, co-owner of Supercars To Be. Oh, That's what I read. Well, hypothetically. Am I jumping the gun? Uh, well, let's talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we're not going to talk about it later. Hi to everyone anyway, welcome back. Uh, we're having a bit of a laugh around here at the moment, bit of a dig. But uh, yeah, we're back on, uh, good to be back in the studio. Uh, we haven't been back in here for a while because we've been out on the road. Thanks for the great response with the PWR. That's a good one. Factory tour. Very good. Yeah, yeah. people loved it. And, and You're good at doing that, Russ, eh? Hey? Hey, I thought the Larry Perkins one was good, but that was, that was real oh, interesting, wasn't stop it? Stop it. Stop pumping up my tyres, mate. Stop it. <laughs> a bit more. Uh, yeah, look, it was good. And it's good to bring those insights as well. And, and, and thanks to all the, uh, everyone involved, Keys, Will, Paul, Will, and everyone involved uh, at PWR for letting us in there because I don't usually let people take that detailed tour of that place because it's Well, that's the trust secretive. we have within the industry yeah. because uh, yeah. we actually captured certain things that we shouldn't have, shouldn't have seen and they, yeah. they said, oh, guys, can you not show that? So... You couldn't trust any other media outlet not to do you over, could you? Not at all. Yeah, you know what media's like. General yeah. media. You yeah. Know, first thing they want to do is burn you. So yeah. burn your bridges. You can never walk over them again. So you have got to be a bit careful. Uh, yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let's roll into it. And the first topic I've got on my little list here, uh, and it is only a little list. I'm winging it a bit today. Is uh, supercars buyout? That's all we're reading at the moment. If you're a supercar fan, yeah. Uh, that um, all these um, groups, and there's two, potentially two, maybe three, um, having a, a, a stab at getting the rights to supercars. Uh, and, uh, and one of the groups that's been put together, which is Peter Adderton, uh, Pete Smith, SCT Transport, um, Mick Doohan, doesn't need any sort of introduction, and a certain Paul Morris name's been thrown around there too. Uh, the second group is headed up by my old mate, Mark Scaife, uh, and TLA Worldwide and TJ Sport, which is, I think, is headed up by Craig Kelly, which is a mate, very good mate of, of Mark Scaife. Yeah. Um, and uh, I hear there's, there's other parties kicking around too. Alan Gow's been, been thrown into the Bingley. mix as well. Yeah, well, all this so, is... So, take me on the tour. What's going well, on? Well, I can't. Well, all this is hypothetical, really. Um, yeah, there's yeah. been some, some leaks. There's been a statement come out from Tim Miles, who, uh, Miles Advisory, who's basically said it is for sale and they are going through a process. So, so it, Tim Miles is the guy that originally origin brokered the deal to sell supercars. When, that's him, yeah, Tim Miles. Okay. And if you know Tim, he's a, a, you know, a long time in motorsport, he used to race Formula Ford. I think he took off to England and was a F3 mechanic for a time with, with uh, docking. Uh, and then... Uh, he sold supercars for the big number back in the day and that really set up his business, but um, he's, he's pretty good at what he does. He'll find the right buyer for it. Um, I don't think there's any any doubt that Pete Adderton would, would throw his hat in the ring and I think he's smart enough to probably surround himself with you know, some right people to fill the gaps where, yeah. where he's not knowledgeable enough. So hypothetically speaking, that, that would be a pretty good, pretty good group of people to have run the sport. <laughs> True. Now, now I just, I just want to try and get a bit more factual here. What's fact and what's fiction? Because you know, let's face it, Pete Adderton's known to like a headline. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. He's a bit yeah. of a, a bit of a headline grabber, and anyone that follows his social media uh, knows he likes to have a dig and throw the bait in here and there just for reaction. Is is the first group of the gal? Do and add it in yourself. Is that serious? Is it a serious deal, or is uh, it? Well, anyone that that would be in that proce process would have signed a non-disclosure agreement, and they couldn't comment. Yeah, about yeah, it. yeah. So, um, in your opinion, <laughs> well, hypothetically, Hypothetical, yeah, hypothetically, yeah, hypothetically yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that that would be a good good bunch of people to to have a crack at at, at running that. You know, I yeah. think I think um, the sport and the way it's run. Needs a galvanising figure like Pete Adder. It needs a, it needs a rainmaker. You know, you need your Bernie Eccleston, you need your Tony Cochran, and you need that that person like 
like Pete, that's that's you know people will follow and do and make mm-hmm. things happen. But um, he's got his weaknesses as well. And if he was going to put a group of people people together, hypothetically, that wouldn't be a bad group of people to fill those gaps. Okay, well I'll come <laughs> I'll come back to that. Let's get to the second group that has been bounced around by the media. Again, yeah. we don't know whether this is factual or not. That, well, we're, we're just going on. Yeah. But but the Mark Scaife. Um, consortium has been kicking around for years, yeah, and it's never really had any legs. Um, is it, a, for what you know so far on that group, is that a serious bit as well? I think there's some. I think that would be that one's been leaked again. Whether they're strategic leaks from Tim Miles trying to sell it and, and get people okay. going, like he, he knows what he's doing. I saw another leak come out about Alan Gow. So, you know, you've got to get the, the feeding frenzy going. And try and get the number up, but <laughs> I think right. every, every bid will be serious because um, I think it's affordable at the moment. Well, that's that's <laughs> why I'm sort of asking the question yeah. because you're spot on with that analogy of a bit like going to a house auction. Yeah. Sometimes you have a few false bidders in there just to pump the price up. Yeah. You know, so that's what we're trying to clear for our for our fans out there what what's fact and what's fiction. Um, there were okay, some players, okay. some media players, some overseas company, yep. but. Uh, but you know, for, when I look at this, it needs to be Australian owned and operated that really understand that market and and um, get get the thing back humming again. Okay, well let's break it down a bit. We we don't know too much about the Mark Scaife one, so we can't comment too much on that because well, we know who they are. Yeah, what, what we they know do, who they but, are. But Craig Kelly's an operator. You yeah, know, they're, and, they're, you know they're, they're, they're more marketing based though, aren't they? More marketing. Sports marketing. Yep. Yeah. Um, Good on good in sponsorship arena and athlete management and yep. do a good job with that. Mark, Mark knows what he's doing around the sport. He's, he's not everyone's cup of tea, um, but he d- amazing man of work ethic. Mm. And if he puts his mind to something, he'll get it done. Yeah, he, yeah. look, look, I'll agree with that. And, <laughs> and I know we've got a lot of history, so it might be surprised to a, a lot of people what, what I'm about to say. Right. But you're right; his work ethic is second incredible. None. Yeah. Behind the scenes, he is, um, but. It, it's got to be sometimes, in my personal opinion, can be a bit over the top, can be a little bit one way street. Yeah. Sometimes you have to be a bit broader and listen to everyone. And I think that's a problem that I can see within supercars at the moment. You've got to take a bit more broader view on, on a, some input and not just be very, you know, single lane, single file. You know? Yeah, well, you can be single file if you're kicking goals. Yeah. But if, you, but if you're not. If you're not, you know, you just end up in this middle management and bureaucracy and you know, no, real, no real direction so it'd be uh, it'd be an interesting one for the fan base because well, the, uh, the f- Mark is very divided <laughs> within yeah. the fan base um, and, and let's face it the fans are important that's what it's about too the fans have got to like the the people that are running the sport and the direction that it's going and too, again in my opinion um, right let's get on to the second one um, if Alan Gow's name is banded around uh, I, I'm a I'm a supporter of Alan Gow. I think he did a really good job back in the day when um, British Touring Car Championship was running that, and then he then he went away for a while. Well, and it's Groundhog Day for him. If if he's in that syndicate, um, I think he's who did he sell out to World Sports Group or something? Yep. British Touring Car Championship yep, yep. got it back for you know a small Nicola percentage of what yeah. he sold yeah. it for and yeah. rebuilt it and run it. And I, he knows what he's doing, and he's yeah, Australian. Yeah, for sure. Yes. Absolutely. He's not English. Yeah, yeah. He's, he understands well, our culture. What I like about Alan Gow is he knows how to run things efficiently. It's yep. like the Larry Perkins of a race team. You know, he knows how to run it. There's your budget. This is how much I've got to spend, and he'll spend it to the cent. You know, he knows how to run efficiently, he'll get it which, done. which I think is something that's really lacking in, in supercars. In, in in respect that I think it's way overbalanced. You know, too much of a spend for return. Uh, as, so, a, as a team? Or? No, 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 as, oh, no, no, yeah, well, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a company, as a category, as a, a yeah. category. absolutely, yeah. you know, so Alan knows how to run on a budget, you know, he knows how to run things efficiently with fewer people, you know, we, and we interviewed him in one of the yeah, earlier episodes. Yeah, he and got great comments, the only thing about Alan, yeah. he's probably a bit far away to be, be super hands-on, so. Does he need to be back, maybe that's the grand plan, does he want to move back to Australia? I don't know. We'll have to ask him. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to get him back on. Yeah. Or well, if he gets legs at will. Peter Adderton, uh, mate, a bit like Mark Scaife up to a point, uh, very divided character, you know, at the end of the day, you know, a, a diversive character as well. Um, he is either liked or yep. people think he's just 
just a bit of a joke. Yeah, but know? then those so, same people like him again next week when he does something that they yeah, like. True. But, so, <laughs> but but he's he built up a fair empire there with the boost and, and he, he runs he runs with some pretty big players both in Australia and America. So um, he's obviously got the runs on the board. Um, and, and like I said, I, I think he's he divides opinion because he's he's hen like grabbers and, and likes bowling one down the lane. But he, uh, he's, he's always liked liked a bit of controversy and liked to be in the media. I've known him a very long time. He's, he's a self made guy. Yeah, he's not prepared to have a go. He's, he's prepared to have a go, yeah, yeah. go at something and risk it and and put it all in there and make things happen. And as I said before, that that's what you need. Yeah. That's what supercars need. Is that is the rainmaker, the guy who's going to. Yeah, make things happen. Most, well, he's been involved in this motorsport for a hell of yeah. a long time. And Alan Gale would be the perfect guy to keep him in check when he does get a bit over the top. Pete Smith, <laughs> um, now he's uh, SCT Transport, built an absolute empire in this country, both in transport in general, both rail and road. Uh, a major player, a major businessman, and uh, he's got to be he's got to be an asset because. He's, he's got a strong business mind. So to me, Agree. Um, you park him in the business sense and say, Pete, what do we need to do? Yeah, to, he knows to, what to, to do. Make, yeah, he knows yeah. what to do. So uh, that's, that's a big tick. Mick Doohan, um, I think, you know, I, I'm trying to place everyone. What I'm trying to do is, is look at this and go, where's your section? Hypothetically, <laughs> where do you sit on everywhere? Because yeah. to me, you know, Mick's uh, got experience worldwide. So he's seen different categories. He's seen the way different operations run. So to me, he, he can bring all that experience in and go, guys, I've seen that before. Don't go down that direction, but yeah. And of course, his name. His, his name, name, his name sells. But yeah. if, if, if he was in the group, and his asset would be his connections and just who the people he has in his phone book. Like if, if you're trying to do a tire <laughs> tender, yeah. you know, he can ring up. The head people at Dunlop, Mitchell, Mitchell and Yokohama, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. You know, okay. he knows them on a first name basis, and and that, you you just can't buy that. What yeah, an asset yeah. to have, like, you know, what an asset to have in, a, in an organisation. Exactly, yeah. and and that's where I sort of I, I looked at it initially and went, oh, there's a lot of chiefs here. This could go pear shaped because if he starts stepping on his shoes and that, and, they, and this could blow up deluxe. Yeah. But, but then I started looking at it a bit of a different way and going, hang on, if everyone knew their strengths, like you just explained with Mick, contacts, man, you can't make up for that. Pete Smith, business mind, added it, marketing. <laughs> I know how to get stuff out there. Yeah. Bang, bang, bang. You know, Gal, you know, right, know how to run it efficiently. And then we have the wild card or the wild child with Paul Wonder. Morris. <laughs> oh, well, you need so, someone who knows about the cars and teams. So you the mechanical side of it yeah. because because to me I, I think and this may seem strange the easiest fix is actually fixing the the back end the engine room do yep. you know what I mean yep fixing the engine room I think is pretty easy and what I say about that is management structure all the rest of it because we've sat here how many times have we sat here and gone just do this 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 and this and and you'll fix yeah, it by 50 percent overnight and you that's know. easy to say, that, and the more you look into this stuff for us, the problem is there's so much legislation and red tape now that you know, business is not like it used to be, and, it, and yeah. it's, it's hard for any business to survive in this red tape area. So the, there are a lot of people bolted in there, but mm. a lot of them are just a necessity now because government regulation has got you by the throat. Yeah. But, yeah, there's, there's definitely some, some savings to be had in, in the business, I think. So, yeah. that, so looking at that, you could... You could Fix the engine room, or, or make a fair dent in it straight away. Yeah. But then you get to the biggest problem of all, and it's the equipment that's doing laps around those tracks. Yeah. And, and that's the biggest issue, and still is. And obviously, obviously, that's where I can see your input coming to it more than mechanical. You know, how can we save costs? How can we make this work? How can we produce a car that's going to be entertaining for the fans? Yeah, and you, right, that, right, so. saving costs. And we've seen that a lot. Like a classic example is the, the supercars introduced a different ring package. And all it's done is cost the team's money with motors. Yep. You know, that wasn't smart. So um, everything has to be thought out and really tested before it's implemented because change costs, costs money. And you've got a clean sheet of paper with Gen 3. You've got to get that right. 
And uh, yeah, in my opinion, I still think the, ball, the, the bar's set a bit too high with that car. I reckon it could be a bit less expensive, capital cost-wise, but um, yeah, that would be a good one to get your teeth into. And that's going to be the challenge. Out yeah. of everything, that's the way I can, I can see, because uh, it's almost like that's been forgotten a bit up to a point, you know, but that, that's what it's all about. The racing is where it all starts yeah, on the track, yeah, and then everything flows off of that, you know, and, and how you structure everything, and uh, that that is going to be a massive challenge. But it's got to be done right and soon, you know. And, and if that, like we said it before, and and I want to get onto this in our next subject, um, is that if you push it out another six months, you know, to get it right, if there is a change of ownership in between that. It wouldn't hurt to get it right. To me, why, why rush it if you don't oh, have to? I'm with you, mate. It has to be done right. The testing has to be done. You have to roll it out. You've got to take the fans on the journey. And if, and if you look at what NASCAR have done, we, we've already reviewed that, but they announced again today that they've just done a strategic partnership with iRacing. You know? mm. it's, they just keep rolling this stuff out all around their new car and their crowds are back. You know, their last two races have been sellouts. Um, yeah, you know, there's, and then their charters are up. Like, I think the rumor is the last charter changed hands for $10 million. All really? built. Yeah, so the price of their charters, which is their franchise system, which guarantees the team's money, they're up because they're up. they've built a sensible car, they've taken money on the journey, and they've planned it. So, the lesson to be learnt there is don't rush it, let's mm. get it right. Now, the, the, when you talk about franchise, and uh, yeah. actually we, in one of our questions, so I'm jumping the gun a little bit, but one of our questions asked about the franchise system, so we might as well jump onto it now, yeah. uh, because the franchise the way it used to be when the team owners owned 75% of the championship, yep. and, and Cochrane's company and SEL uh, owned 25%, yeah. the other 25%. And, the, and that was a sports marketing company. James Erskine was, was the major shareholder, brilliant guy, managed, you know, sports manager, manager Shane Warne, Michael Parkinson, wealth of knowledge, and then you had Tony the Rainmaker, and those two worked really well together. You know, they, when Tony was, you know, got excited and mm. got a bit loose, you had James there to bring him back into check. You know, it was a good relationship. Mm. They would work really well together. So tell me this then. Uh, I, I always thought yep. the sale of the championship, all along I thought this was short-term gain for yeah. long-term pain that that was my thoughts on it all along I, I i didn't get it because i thought hang on you're selling your soul here you're selling your your revenue because they used to at one stage you're getting over nine hundred thousand. Yeah, it was up a to a million bucks a million, million bucks dollars. a car plus you got free tires and so it's a good deal uh, and that the franchise were worth between 1.5 to 1.8 million dollars yep to buy a franchise back then uh, after the sale and where it is now. The bloke who sold his franchise for the highest money ever was Tim Miles. What's that? <laughs> he got yeah. 1.7 or something for the, for the Tasman one. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> there you go. And Greg, Greg Mur that was, was that Murphy's? <laughs> yeah. And he, mi he missed out on the payout, <laughs> which, which I'm sure is still a sore point at the moment. Uh, I'm sure there would have been a settle-up somewhere. Yeah, I, I'm sure. But, Those uh, Kiwis wouldn't date each other, would they? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Aussies dud each other, don't they? So I'm not sure Kiwis do the same. Probably better. They do it with more style. <laughs> hey, um, Kiwi fans, mate. So to me, uh, as as like, as a third or fourth option. So say all this doesn't eventuate. The, the buyouts don't eventuate. Archer Capital don't agree to whatever it may be. It, is, an, is there an option for the teams? Teams haven't got the money to buy it back off of Archer, right? So well, I don't. I wouldn't say that. There's definitely an option for the teams to buy it. Is there? Yeah, yeah. Well, that, well, that was my thoughts. I thought, yeah. well, hang on. I, I, I still hear that these, the, the groups, I don't know whether the group that you're um, allegedly or apparently involved in, yeah. so the rumours go, and, and, and the SCAFE, uh, Kelly one, um, they're, they're going to get it alone because of the revenue that does you, you come back through. You can borrow money on cash flow of that business, no worries. But why don't yeah. the teams do that then? So my I reckon point, my point I've... is, why don't the teams it's an option, bank though. roll it, get it, buy it back, and if the, th if the revenue is coming back through, they can pay off the loan quite easily, and they own, at least get their 75%, maybe sell it to a marketing company or sport, or whoever maybe the other 25%, take it back to where it was, so at least they get a decent revenue back again to run the teams, to run the cars. Yeah, and, and that would make sense if the team, team owners were united and you had 
the races left in the room. Ah. You know, you, you look at who owns the teams now, they're all off doing different things. Um, when the teams owed 75% of it, it was full of people that were team owners that were passionate, and that was their core business. If it didn't make money, they no. didn't eat. So I, th I think you've got a bunch of team owners there that probably don't want to be in business with each other. Right. Yeah, they've all got different values, doing different things, that, which is okay. Um, well, then but if they did buy it and did keep control of it, which they could do, they'd need to go and put, a, put someone like Pete Adderton in charge of it to make it work. So, so it's, still, it's still relevant. Like even if they took one of these groups to take that 25% and still run the thing, it's still a possibility. Yeah, but I reckon if all the bids come in, and the kicker to this is the teams have got tag-along rights. So they can, whoever buys Archer Capital share, they can force them to buy the team share as well. So they can, they can control the bid a no. bit. So if it got to the point where they didn't like who had bid and the number wasn't right, 100% the teams could come back in and take this out. Yeah, okay. But the best thing the teams can do is tag along, get rid of their shareholding, put a deal in place where they no longer make decisions on how the championships run and do what NASCAR have done, their charter system, where they don't own it, but they, they get really good turn-up money. Mm. Turn up, race the cars, and forget about the politics. And you need that you need that dictator in there to tell you what's happening because... Is this going to be the same problem, though, no matter what, with the two or three groups, whoever's bidding for it, um, is for, for the supercar uh, nameplate, yeah. um, is that... That there'll be, there's no way I can see, knowing a lot of the team of franchise owners, that they're going to be 100% behind either of the groups because they'll have an issue with one of them. There'll yeah, be I think people that don't out. like Mark Scaife. There'll be people that don't like Peter Adderton, Paul Morris, um, Mick Doan, whoever it may be. And so is that going to be the challenge in getting everyone to agree or will it come down yeah. to a case of who... Who dislikes who the least will get it. <laughs> From experience and seeing how the last sale went, that's why you have someone like Tim Miles. Because yeah. he, he might start off with 10 and keep taking all these different parties on the journey till he end up with two in the room. And he's probably already worked out which is going to make him the most money and be best for the teams and he'll sell it to everyone. That's, that's why Tim Miles is in charge of this process because yeah, he, he, that's what he does. He sells businesses, mm -hmm. he's good at it and he'll get the right outcome for everyone. He'll make money doing it, but he'll do a good job. Because the brand itself is still a strong brand, isn't it? And, and I liken it to Tony Quinn buying Daryl Lee. Yeah. Like to me, that was a, a no-brainer. You've got a smart businessman that knew that procedure um, and came from that background with VIP, pet foods. It's still, yeah, it's... Dog food. Yeah, he knew but, manufacturing. But at the end of the day, he knew manufacturing yeah. in yeah. that price. So he, Darryl Lee's a bit different because that... they were in retail pretty heavily, which, which is what hurt them. But he got to eject the retail side of the business and just take the manufacturing. I'm talking yeah. just as a brand, though. Yep. He, he knew he brand. that brand, yep. Darryl Lee, that was a strong brand, and that would take decades to build up. He can't buy it. He can't buy it. So is supercars along the same way? It's, yeah. It look, is, mate. But it, you know it, what people still call it wherever you go? The V8s. V8s. No V8s one calls supercars. it supercars. True. From politicians to kids to everyone, yep. those, oh, the V8s are here. The V8s are here. So well, maybe not too to. hard to work out what your first decision is going to be when you, whoever buys it, is Straight it? Straight up. That's marketing Big, yeah. 101, mate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because I, I think, and the supercar tag, when it got changed, it was too confusing because all of a sudden, because what do they call supercars? Supercars are known as Lamborghinis, oh, for me it is. Porsche. Yeah. You know, that, that's a with paddle shifts. And... Yeah, that's a supercar. Yeah. A little low skateboard with a big yeah. engine in it, and, and that's a supercar. You know, even yeah, if, supercars are strong. Even if you listen to you know, NASCAR guys talk about our sport, it's those V8, those V8 guys in Australia. You know, that's, absolutely. Yeah. And that's branding, isn't it? Yep. Which is all part of it. So, yep. okay, it's going to be an interesting ride. Or be. Uh, be hanging on, as I'm sure everyone else. There'll will be some be, serious so. players in that. Oh yeah, and then yeah, Tim sure. Miles would have pitched that to a lot, of, lot of, lot of people. So, be oh, it's going to be an interesting. Look little for the strategic few, leaks to keep months. coming. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've no doubt, and I understand you can't say too much if you're involved, but that's that's good. I think we've said enough without saying anything. That's no, good summary. So, uh, yeah, yeah, no, it, it is good, and I hope that's filled everyone in, and because there's a lot of questions that haven't been answered, so you just have to dissect this a little bit and yep. and, and narrow it down, and then. 
and then see what the fa yeah, ultimately that's what the fans think is going to be best for the sport too because that's that's one of the most well, important without them, things. Without that, mate, we might as well sit at home. Is it? Do you pack up, pack up and go? Um, now let's jump on to because we spoke a little bit about Gen Three. Uh, now come out saying mid, and, and we did a full show on that Gen Three, really dissected it properly, gave our opinions. So if you haven't seen it, roll back onto the YouTube channel and have a look at that. Um, Gen Three 2022 mid-year release. Now. Uh, mate, uh, again, I'll get your opinion on it. Mine in particular, I reckon it's a complete lunacy. And, and in Darwin, I ran around and spoke to a few people, a few drivers and that, and they were of the same opinion. And, and, I, and I'll give this reason, right? I'll give this reason that, okay, you're Paul Morris, right? You're rolled in the 2022 season. Uh, you've just absolutely nailed it. Yep. Driver, team, car, going out, you're leading the championship by 300 points. Happy days. You're just winning every race or coming in the top three, right? You get to mid-year. This new rig rolls into town, right? Out with that. Bugger all testing. Got to be... All right. Get, oh, Jesus. I'm struggling. I'm not qualifying in the top 10. I'm finishing 15th. All of a sudden, Fred Flogg at the back. He's winning races. You lose the championship. You lose the champ. Yours, you were going to win that championship. Right. Yeah, well, you lose Change credibility. Change your cars and you lose the champ. How happy are you going to be? Well, you're not going to be happy. And look, you, have to, you don't have to look too far to see that if you look at when they bought the control engine, I think the inwheel based engine in the truck series, they yep. went to a control yep. engine. They thought it had it all under control. And about halfway through the season, they had the massive engine failures and it mixed up all the championship and they started blaming the supplier. So I think the rest of the car could be okay. But um, I'd like to see how many kilometres in testing and that they had on the, the engines before they, they went. Because who knows where the sweet spot's going to be of that control engine. Oh, uh, and, it's and a big, big change. And if they're going to do it, and it's for, for financial reasons yeah, yeah. or it's marketing reasons or it's going to change the sport, come out and tell us why it's mid-year yep. and we might be able to swallow it. Yep. Well, <laughs> well, going on that, it's funny. I read, I read an article and it's, it's great that in my opinion supercars watch our show because they came out with an article saying um, we're going to be more transparent about the Gen 3 and we're going to take fans on the journey, quote, fans on the journey into Gen 3, right? Jeez, I wonder where they got that from. I'm pretty well sure we use exactly the same wording, taking fans on the journey with NASCAR, remember? We're saying yeah, that well, over they, and over again. We, we, so, we're saying that, yeah. so they've rolled into that. Uh, they we're, use the exact words. So, so <laughs> look, it, look, it's great they're listening, you know, and, and yeah. because it's true. That's what they should be doing. And, and to me, that rest of the six months of 2022, that's what they should be doing. Testing, bringing fans on the journey, you know, of all, and you could still... You could still make a storyline out of it without actually having to race it. Yeah. And then end of 2022, that's when you bring it out and go, right, we're ready to rock and roll, you know? Well, if I was those in that position, I'd just go and hire you and me to do it. Hmm. And go, hey, can you guys do all this for us? Yeah. <laughs> Independently yeah. of it. And if it's good, we'll tell you it's good. Well, it's like the testing of it, they I could get, never get my head around due to the testing. The testing should be totally independent as well. Well, it's a bit oh, hard I, when, that, when that falls back on the teams and, the, and the, there's not enough people in that area in supercars. So the, traditionally, the teams have always done it. Why have they done it? Because yeah. you had a massive amount of money coming from GM. You had a massive yeah. amount of money coming from Ford, and they paid for it. Yep. Now, I think there's some money coming from Ford to do the Ford side of it. From what I know about it, there's no money real money coming from, from GM, but they got permission to use the car. Why have they got permission to use the car and do that? Because of Roland's relationship with Mark Royce. So... But just the, just the way you're, they You're do, right, it should at be least, At least get advice, because if I was out there, and you'd be exactly the same, if we were out there on a test day, yeah. and you see these dudes and they're flogging around all day going, oh yeah, we'll give it give it three wines of adjusters on the back platform, or put a roll bar, and you go, serious guys, right. But okay. who would you give it to? And, and that's all they do. If you were supercars and you said, oh, we're going to not let the teams do this new mm. car and you're going to give that job to someone, they can't do it internally, who would you give it I'll to? I'll just give it to someone that's got a mechanical, a very good mechanical knowledge. So a race car. team somewhere in a street, like a Michael Ritter to yeah, test it? Yeah, plenty of teams, mate. Plenty of teams are capable of doing it. Plenty Run of the teams. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Race, and do that it. way no teams get an advantage on it too because it's always that part of it. Yeah. The teams that are doing the development are going to have an advantage. Yep. Hands down. 
no, no doubt about it. So they shouldn't have any leg up compared, and they say, oh, that, that's going to be transparent, we're going to share it. doesn't matter, that driver and that team are going to have a better knowledge base of the car. They are, and, and it's the old system, mate, because you had, as I said, you had the Ford and Holden, they had the homologation teams, they fed all the, they fed all the information down. Yep. That system's no longer there. But, but you watch, they'll test, and all they do is they'll flog around for days and days and days and weeks and weeks and weeks and go around. And you know what? I bet you none of them do a race simulation. Oh, they they will, probably mate. will now because we'll they bring will. it up. They will. No, a race simulation as far as race. Get the two and race the things like you're having a race. <laughs> That's a good one. Well, it's no, no one's, I've no never, one's done for, yeah. I've never seen a test, but I'm pretty well sure that they've never actually done, when I say race simulation, not doing yeah, 50 but, laps, I mean going out there and racing each other, and all of a sudden they would have found out, oh, Jesus, when we're following the car, we've got no arrow in the front, the thing understeers like a dog. Yeah, it's a good point. Go yeah. out there and do it. So there, there you go, I'm giving you a first heads well, up. Well, NASCAR so, do it. They do it. They, yeah. Exactly right. With yeah. that, they're on the ovals. That, you know, well, you have to, yeah. because the arrow is so, so important. important. So, it, and if they did that, not running up and down a, a, a runway, an airfield going, oh yeah, we think they're pretty well the same downforce, even though they're like about 40% more. You know, like, <laughs> you know, it's just a joke. Hey, mate, I was, I gotta tell you. So we're at Darwin with the trucks, right? So we're up at a little corporate suite we had up there. I'm looking down on the grid. Yeah. And when you haven't been involved in a while, and you it's take a corporate you, you box, different, it? it was a nice, got nice food. Um, and uh, well, you're standing up there, and when you haven't been in the game for a while, I'm standing up there looking at all the cars on the grid, and yeah. there's all everyone going around doing whatever they do. Uh, and you're looking at the cars themselves, and I'm looking at the wings on these things. Jesus Christ, I'm looking at the overhang, how far, forward and holding, they're hanging at the back, the thing looks like a Boeing 747 wing on the back of the Mustang, and just generally, between the two cars, you look at them and go, are you serious? Like, when they rolled these things out for homologation, who would have stood back and went, yep, we're pretty well sure that's the same as last year? And you look at it, like I was in Triple Eight Workshop the other day, and you saw the VF Commodore, you know, the Super yeah, 2 yeah, yeah. Brock's car. Yeah. Right? And you looked at that. It's grown again. And, and I'm, looking, I'm looking at the, other, the latest Commodore, I'm going, seriously? Like, you look at these two and you went, yeah, they're, they're the same downforce. God, seriously, get a grip. Like, yeah, well, mate, don't. It just doesn't make sense, does it? Oh, it doesn't. Yeah, that's one thing that really, really stood out. Um, I s sat next to Larko on the plane, actually, over on the way to Darwin, so we had a good old chinwag. It was quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's, he's, he said he's doing a lot more tech pieces, behind-the-scenes stuff. All right. As well. I wonder where they got that. I know. We'll have to start doing a bit behind-the-scenes <laughs> stuff, won't we? So, uh, yeah, but he reckons... Uh, oh, I said to him, is it... <laughs> <laughs> is that sarcastic enough? Yeah, yeah okay. I, I said to him, is, is it a bit weird going back? Because I said to him about the whole thing that happened with him when he got flung and then yeah. they came back on groveling on their knees and got him back again. And, and knowing Larko too, he would have wrote a big invoice. So, <laughs> good on you, Larko. He would have smashed him a bit. So, um, yeah, it was, it was quite interesting what he was saying, but he's got a bit of a free reign there now. So, yeah, he's doing a lot more tech pieces, as you were saying. And, Good. Well, which is good, exactly what you need oh, to do. Oh, people want that content, people, mate. People want to not, see... Not everyone, answer. but there's a, no. the hardcore fans want to see that stuff, and he does a great job of presenting it. If but. I see another article or video on a driver's new helmet design, or they've changed colours on the helmet, dead set, I'll throw up. Yeah, but, I'm, I'm uh, with you yeah, I, I want to see behind the scenes stuff. I want to see mechanical, gutsy, what makes things tick, work. So, and Marco's good at that sort of stuff. He's brilliant. So It was good to catch up with him, by the way. Uh... <laughs> Uh, now, Ambrose, Marcus Ambrose, and, and again, I, I was on a social mission at Darwin. I caught up with him for dinner, and he's, he's taken who, up... Who shouted? Hey? Marcus shouted. Really? Good on First time, <laughs> seriously. You reckon he put the invoice into supercars? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, supercars. Yeah, it was a lovely dinner. I, I would have got a car from more bottles of wine if I knew you were footing the bill. And, uh, yeah, so it was good catching up with him, and he said he's taken on a consultancy role. At GRM. GRM, yeah. Yeah, nothing to do with ARG, he pointed out. Um, but a consultancy for GRM as a group, because they're taking on so much. They've got the TCR and... There's a lot of cars down there. A lot of cars down there, and, and more so just um, organisation. You know, how to get more out of the team itself and drivers and everything else with it. And he's... Um, He's really enjoying it. He said, he said he's, he's already started. He's been down there for a while and he just enjoys doing it. So. Yeah, I think that's a good move. You need 
He's got, if you think about his international experience and the size of the teams and what they would have done in America and the yep. amount of people involved, he definitely would have come back from there with a lot of information and ideas. So Yeah, massive amount. Yeah, that's a good one for, no, no, for Gary good. and Barry to have him, him there. These daughters are racing too as well, carts and yeah. you get yeah. into a bit of car racing too. So, um, yeah, he reckons, uh, yeah, he's loving life at the moment. It's very good in that. Hey, what, what do you reckon's going on with the commentary, dude? The commentary side of things, in, in because uh, Tanda really seems to be the flavour of the month at the moment. He's really got in there and just grabbed it and kicked huge goals. Been accepted by the crowd because Tanda can be a bit divisive. Yeah, All the, the feedback's been really good on it. The fact um, that he's still racing for Triple Eight and he's been accepted really means he's doing a good job. True, because no one's Absolutely. even even the driver when he comes up and interviews some of the other drivers who you think might be. Oh, I got to race you in October. Yeah, they're they're reacting with him. So yeah, he's obviously. I think he's doing a great job. Marcus, I like it. Marcus is doing a real good job. Yeah. He's been he's had good reviews online. Um, do you reckon a few of the regulars would be feeling the pressure a bit? Oh, I think so, and and that's just part of being in that industry, Russ. That sometimes you need a need a change and and things change, which you you've you know yep. you've, you've been yeah, on yeah, the other end yeah, of that. Yeah. So um, it was good. Obviously, Neil couldn't be there because he's yep. he's crook. Shout out to Neil. Hey, hope you're yep, going yep, all right, mate. Yep. Um, but but Chad. Did a great job. Yeah, it's, so yeah, it's going to be interesting that dynamic. I, I just see it, and I, and I know what Tanda's like. Like he's an operator. He's been around the game enough, and I know what he's like. And uh, everyone was a bit surprised about the dynamics between him and Scaife and a few of the others. We're right together, yeah, mate. There's plenty of feeling there. <laughs> don't 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 believe they're good buddies. Don't believe yeah. that. You know, there's been plenty of feeling there. But uh, you know, Tanda can outmanoeuvre most. Behind the scenes, he knows how to operate. Well, be interesting know, so to see he'd, how that plays he'd be out. in there. He'd be stirring the pot a bit. I, I reckon it's pretty. But that's what we want. It'd be good actually getting a bit of fire and passion, not so much buddies, buddies and mates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the commentary worked worked well, and the change was good, and I enjoyed enjoyed the different combinations. Yeah, yeah. you know. And let's not forget, most of us don't turn on the telly because of the commentators. We yeah. turn on to watch a good race. Most, yeah. So if the racing's good. All they have to do is call the race. We, we, <laughs> yeah. we you need guys that are really yeah, good yeah, at their yeah. craft, which Neil is, and, and, and Mark is very good at when there's nothing going on, yeah. they find stuff to talk yeah, about. Very, very good point. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But if, if the racing's good, anyone can commentate yeah, it. Just yeah. Fred hit Fred and he ran off the track, and it's when yeah. shit gets boring that you need good guys. So, so it's more to enhance the racing, but at the moment, I think they probably have to pedal a little bit more because yeah. the racing actually hasn't been. Racing's been all right, actually. Day one racing was pretty good. So, how good? <laughs> that, mo that move with Shane Van Gisbergen on Anton. I know, yeah. they're, I know they're both they're both Norwell friendlies, uh, but, geez, Anton got caught with his pants down there. Yeah, no, he freely admitted, but... Um, the, got to get tougher. Well, I don't think he could break that late, so he... He just knew if he sent it in that hard, he wouldn't be able to stop. Yeah, he okay. thinks that the you know, triple eight car has a braking advantage in a straight line, and they use it to effect. And Antoine tried to cut underneath him, and then obviously yeah. Scott Pye just arrived there too quick, which yeah, yeah. turned it all. But he shit. did. He did leave a hole there. When you got someone like Shane, yeah, yeah, well, he should have just stayed to the left and let no, Shane just... work it out around the outside, which he would have made it probably anyway. So yeah, just prop it up. But Jesus, he's he's not shy or Shane, is he? He knows his strengths and he has a go, mate. Which... <laughs> I, I like watching it, though. Yeah. It's just, he just, he just, mate, you know he, and, he's, he's, and he's got all the drivers so psyched now, psyched out, that they're dead set driving in the rear vision mirrors. They're, they're just looking for him because they're thinking, which side is he going to go? And while you're doing that, you're not concentrating going fast. No, well, I've, I've got a bit, a bit of a theory on why he's going all right, too. All right. You're going to roll it? Or? I think it's bound to do with the tyre pressure. Okay. I think he just drives to the tyre pressure. Like if, if you look at, they bought out the super soft tyre yeah, in Darwin yeah. and yeah. sent the 17 PSI limit. Yeah. And then the teams are putting the tyres out and they're baking them and bleeding them down and baking them and yeah, bleeding yeah, them yeah. down. But I just think he knows how to drive that car and keep the tyre pressures under control because the tyre pressures are getting sent back to the telemetry, back to the teams. Yeah, yeah. They know exactly where that is and... I think he's got something going on that no one's ever thought about. Okay. Because it's that, you look at the tyre deg, there's no, yes, he's driving to the tyre, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I reckon he's got something going on about 
keeping the tyre pressure under control, which is basically keeping the tyre under control, yeah, but yeah, thinking yeah. about it completely different. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Because well, he, yeah, he just has no deg. And if you look, he starts the race, he goes off and he builds the tyre up and he... Builds it up, yeah, It, it yeah, looks yeah. like Mick doing on the five month. You know? Yeah, yeah. And then away he goes and he just controls the whole thing. Actually, if you look at some <laughs> MotoGP riders are similar to that too. They'll hang around yeah. and just be in either first, second or third and they'll just stay there or just stay there, gradually get in the lead and stay there. And then all of a sudden, hammer down, gone. So the more yeah, they so introduce this high deg tyre, the more he... Just finds out a way to drive around drive it. Drive around it. And I, th I think he's got all, every other driver completely baffled yeah, by yeah. how he's doing it. That's cool. <laughs> hey, um, speaking of MotoGP stuff too, I've got a, um, uh, I've got a little, uh, little video here for you, which yep. you know how we've been talking a lot about gear shifting. Yep. Paddle shift versus grabbing yep. it with your hand. Yep. Uh, motorbikes, right? So yep. let me take you through this because it's, it's, it's really cool, right? It's a really cool little piece. Uh, Smart Mac Air's 2017, right? But MotoGP, right? So they've got a similar sort of system, auto shifter. So it's just pegged like a supercar. It's a shift and just, cut. And just plug, plug, yeah, just plug gears. Cuts it, same sort of system. Cuts the engine just minutely yeah. to get a clean shift. Uh, but it's still foot operated. So think of their foot like your arm in a car. It's still foot operated. Now, I called up, uh, how good's this? When they, look at, he actually misses, he misses the gear, gear. Let's go back and have another look at that. It's pretty cool. He actually misses where the footrest is and, put, and puts his heel on, the shifter. on top of the shifter. But they actually have got an auto blip system. That's one thing they actually have got. But also the clutch slips as yeah, well. Yeah, they've got the slip So clutch. they can jamp it through so yeah. it doesn't, you know, yeah. lock the back wheel, hydraulic lock the back wheel with the engine braking. And they can obviously adjust all that, adjust it all with the electronics as well. Um, but the point being with all this is that they still operate it with a foot. And I believe it's regulation that they have to do it with a foot. Can't do it via any other means. Okay. It has to be done with a foot. To keep it relevant, to, relevant to, as you know, jump on a motorbike, unless it's a little scooter, you've got to change gears, right? So um, I rang up Chris Vermeulen, Suzuki right. MotoGP rider. Fantastic guy, really genuine, nice guy. He doesn't work for Fox anymore. He either, doesn't does work it? for Fox. He got, no, no, got right. cut there too, budget cuts. There's another story there too, a lot yeah. of cuts going I on. I thought he was good on that. He was bloody good, and I'll yeah. tell you what, a massive loss. Yeah. Uh, great guy, very knowledgeable, tapped into we everyone in made a show I've already asked him. Oh, have you? He said he's come on. Oh, good. Yeah, we're going to get him on. So, for bike. but mate, he's just, I was asking him stuff, and he's just reeling it off, and it's bang, 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 bang. I got, mate, we've got to get this guy <laughs> on the show. So, for bike fans, we're going to get Chris on. Fa yeah. Like I said, fantastic, smart guy, um, both, you know, as far as bikes go and outside as well. He's done pretty well for himself. So, um, he was saying, like, he's, He's almost 90% sure that it is regulation you have to change with your foot. He said Troy Bayless, when he was in Ducati and Superbikes, they did come up with a system with buttons, buttons on the bars yeah. and they banned it straight away. Right, okay. So he couldn't do it. Um, he said, yes, there is an auto blip system where you grab a gear or It'll, whatever and, and it does. Yeah, then. it does. It's between slipping the clutch. And, and, and electronics as well, blipping it as well, where they can just put it through, and that's totally just. He said they tune the bike at race meetings with that alone. Yep. The handling of the bike. You with know, if it's got a bit of push, yeah, and, or, or a bit, bit of push engine front, braking, engine or braking. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. And the other interesting part about it, dude, was that he was, I was saying, oh, because you see on Mark Marquez's it was always down. He said there was riders that actually went in reverse. They liked to flick it yeah, Darryl, up the gears. Yeah, Daryl was stacked the gears the other yeah, way. Yeah, it was double. Chris yeah. did. Chris, yeah. Chris from Mullen did. Uh, Kevin Schwantz, Wayne Gardner was all liked clicking them up, which I thought felt very odd. Because he said most riders, most of the riders like Marquez like it because as they're coming out of a corner, they're changing gears. They can just do that and keep yeah, the balance. Okay. Yep. You know, so it'd be really odd if you were coming out and you had to, had to go up, flick it up. Yeah, so it was... Uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty common. Yeah, so we've got to get Chris way. in because, like I said, he was reeling a lot of stuff on about the electronics side of it and, and everything else in between. It was really interesting. But there we have a world format, world-renowned format, one of the best motorsport categories in the world, changing with your foot like you have done for 
So you're saying we hundred years of keep the gear stick of, in the supercars is what you're saying. Well, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. There's a yeah. category that is technically advanced, uh, but they are still keeping relevant. Yeah, well, relevant the, to the what amount of technology on those things, they could probably just the computer could just change gears whenever it wanted. Oh, to. They could. Yeah. yeah, same as a Formula One car. Because you think if you have yeah. buttons on the handlebars, yeah. and you're coming out of a corner and you're just doing this. You can keep your balance better because you're not taking your foot off to, and you're not moving yeah. your foot around. It, it would have to be better. So if they could do it, they would. So there's obviously a regulation saying they have to, Okay. you know. So I might be right. I, I looked everywhere to find it, and Chris wasn't totally sure if he said, look, yeah, you're right. If they could do it, they'd put it on the bars. Yeah. So I just thought that's an interesting fact and, and probably a bit more uh, fuel to keeping this, which I don't think is going to happen in the Gen 3 anyway. But anyway, we'll, keep, know, we'll keep throwing We'll keep throwing it on the on the fuel on the know. fire. Depends who ends up owning it, I suppose. True. Yeah. Wonder who that could be, dude. Anyway, um, now the second thing is uh, keeping on motorbikes because we're big motor motorbike fans here. Um, is your Ducati whole shot device? Oh yeah. And I found this online, and it's actually really cool on how it operates because you can't really see it that well. That's what they do. The, the big stop coming into the. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, no. This is the rear. So yeah, check it out. Check it out. So this is uh, Jack Miller. Look at that. So he oh. lines up. Look at this. It's like air suspension on the yep. rear. Wait for it. So he sets himself out. Yep. You see the rear? Hang on. We're, yeah. we're taking, 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 taking another look. So, so he pulls up, right? Pulls up. Now watch the back. Watch the back of the bike. He hits it. Look at the squat <laughs> down. Yeah, gotcha. Like an air suspension. Cool he obviously locks the front in as well. Yeah. Gets it, so it's got all the weight on the rear. And boom. Look at the front, the rear suspension doesn't even move. Oh cool. Pretty cool. But what what, what blows me out about it, dude, is is that um, the technology to have that, like it must have some sort of like electronic device that, that preloads the, the rear suspension down or, or something well, the in there. Or something? But how does it do it all in keeping the weight of the bike? And, and it's got to be put back to normal by the time we get to turn one as well. So oh, Imagine if it locked down. And you, oh, and it has a couple of times. Has a couple it? of people have run wide, yeah. Had a failure. Far out. Like, I see others have got other types of device now. They're all catching up with that now. But when that first came out, the Ducatis were just firing past everyone at yeah, the Yeah, they always leap off the line. Now they've worked it out. But I just thought it was a cool bit of vision. Because, it is. Um, right, now, um, we, uh, well, I had a little bit of a, uh, uh, we've had a few requests about oh. the restoration oh. um, of the SBR, my championship winning Falcon. Yeah. Haven't been out there for a while, so uh, I, um, I grabbed young Pete, our cameraman, and we, we fired out there and, and took a bit of a update update of it. And uh, it's come a long way, because last time we were in out there uh, on previous episode, um, it was just a bare shell, just about to get sent out for painting. It's come a long way since then. So went down to the SBR shop, walked in and, uh, and had a look. So uh, there's a bit of a catch up on SBR 2005 championship winning Falcon restoration project. Thanks for letting us back into the uh, the old haunt. The old den. I know, I know. Yeah. Looking good. A bit more stuff yeah. around here, but uh, yeah. I'll tell you what, she's, she's taken a bit of a shape because last time we were here, we um, uh, she was down to a bare roll cage. You were just about to send it away and got painted. So yeah. you've had that done. Yeah. Original paint, original grey on the roll cage. Yep, that's a chassis colour that we used to use all our cars. Every car was. Every SBR car was that colour, isn't it? Yep, yep. And, um, you know, at the moment, we're going to run the engine soon. We've yep. just, just finished all the, well, the wiring's all ready. We can put the dash back in, but we yep. want to run the engine first. And yep. Uh, this engine here, Ross, this is one of yeah, the original engines that I ran. Yeah, I, it would need to dig out the stuff, but the engine number is one that you race with. Is yeah. that right? Yep. So she's... All original yeah. numbers yeah. matching, as they say in the uh, in the yeah. resto world. Yeah. 
Haha, <laughs> gotcha. You thought we were going to run the whole piece. No, nah, that's just a little bit of a teaser of the SBR restoration project. The good old 2005. So keep watching. We're going to bring that to you very, very soon. Separate um, piece. Separate piece. Yeah, yeah, might run it. There's enough content there. Yeah, there is. Yeah, it's really good. And look, Ross, I love catching up with Ross. And I caught up. Jimmy's a bit, a bit um, camera shy. You know, he, he doesn't like the camera, but right. saying, the, saying that, Jimmy was there on the day and I said to him, look, Jimmy, I, I've got to do something with you with engines because he's an engine man. And he was responsible for those SBR engines back in that period where they won the right. three championships. And, and trust me, I know firsthand, they were, oh. they were strong. They were strong. And he said, oh, look, the engine shop's still are there. DJR um, run their engine program from yeah. the old SBR shop. But he said, look, he'll ask him, we're sure we can get in there and we'll try and bring you... Well, I, I want to ask him about engines of that era, but also get in the dyno room, see if we can see an it's engine good, running, yeah. give it a pull. It's a good one. Yeah, so we've got, we've got that well, lined up. Well, that's Mo Moztech run yes. that. Yep. Steve Amos and yep. uh, Bobby Irvine. Yep. And they're responsible for the Coyote... Gen 3 engine. Oh, there you go. We should, maybe we should ask them if we can get a look in there Yeah. about okay. what they're going to do no, with no, that okay. We'll get there. That'd be really interesting. But it, it's just cool to go back because that engine shop in that era, that was it. That yeah. was like the Penske of engine shops. They, it they, still they, is. They, they were talk. Yeah, still, yeah. Others have caught up now and Kenny Mack. Kenny's got yeah, a good shop. That's a good shop. But, but that was it. That was state-of-the-art stuff. Dino rims lined up. It was really... So to go in there was... Right I, I used to go in there during the week and go, oh, this is so cool. You know, so we'll take it for a tour through there. Jimmy said he's going to tell us all about those eras of each and all the little tricky stuff that they used to do. And so that will be cool. So, yeah, we've got plenty of SBR stuff for all the Ford fans. You will have a ball with that. <laughs> hey, um, questions, because we, we, um, we've been throwing out uh, yep. um, on, the, uh, on the Facebook page, you know, throwing some questions. You get some good ones here, mate. You know, yeah, because as you always say, we don't know everything, so... Uh, throwing some questions, so we'll, we'll do a bit of ping pong. Okay. Um, throw it back and some forwards. Uh, so I've got one here uh, from Bradley Michael. He said, hey Russell, what's the history of this car, meaning the wild card triple eight car that will be racing oh, the actual with chassis. Finney, The chassis, yeah, which yeah. good question. Not too many, not many people. Actually, I didn't know the history of it, so I had to uh, make a few phone calls. So it's Wing Cup's car from 2020. Uh, I'm not sure whether this is a good thing. It's the one that he crashed at lap 31 at Bathurst. Oh, yeah. It wasn't a big crash. It wasn't a big crash, but it hasn't got a good history of... Uh, mind you, Jamie Winkup hasn't had a good history at Bathurst either, by the way, too. So, well, he's a lot better uh, than ours. Hey? He's got a few more wins than us. <laughs> not at Bathurst. Has he? He's got four. Oh, Jesus. Okay, <laughs> maybe yes. Maybe it's all right. There. God, okay. Fair enough. Sorry, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> I must have skipped those ones. It's all the ones that got away. You should have ten. I know <laughs> we should have ten. Yeah, tell me about that. Um, but yeah, so it's uh, it's got a, it's but it has got a good history. Ten poles, ten wins. So it's a pretty handy item. It is. Yeah. So it's not a dud. No so, excuses, Russ. So, brother, no, no, pressure's on. Uh, it's got a heap of little uh, like like fighter planes, you know, on the on, on the, the, door, on panel? the door panel. Yeah, it's got all those it's things. Exciting so, when you see that. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. I know, yeah. but a bit of pressure too. So. Uh, yeah, so anyway, that's the history of the wild card super cheap uh, Commodore that we'll be racing. So there you go. What do you got, dude? Well, we've got a bit of a sprint car stuff, and we get okay, a, yep. people always want us to do speedway. Yep, yep, yep. This is from Craig Pearl. I know Craig, he's always seen him out at the speedway. Yep. Uh, he wants to know about the Aussies kicking ass in America. So, yeah, a um, few Aussies over there at the moment. Um, obviously, you've got um, Kerry Madsen's just stepped into Tony Stewart's. Actual okay. car, which makes him Donny Shot's teammate. And he's had a couple of wins straight up. And then James McFadden is driving for Casey Kane. So it's probably two of the best uh, sprint car teams in Australia with the Aussies driving for him and doing a good job. And then we've got young Lachlan McHugh, Jamie McHugh's. Yeah, yeah, Jamie yeah, McHugh. yeah. His son's over racing in... Uh, um, Lockie's over there racing in America at the moment as well. Cool. Doing a good job. Had a couple of podiums. I don't think a win's too far away. Yep, so yep. well represented in America in the off season. That's traditionally what a lot of Aussies do. They cruise over to America and and um, race over there. And when they come back to Australia for summer, they'll be sharp. And and um, you know the Americans used to come out to Australia and then see how good the Aussies were and go, oh, we need to take some of these drivers over there. So awesome to see. Awesome to see. Yeah, yeah. Well, we will. I know we keep saying, it, but we've got to get out and do more. 
speedway stuff and drag racing stuff too, which yeah. is uh, well, we'll get we'll, uh, if Donnie Shots is ever allowed back in the country, we'll get him on the oh, we'll absolutely. get him on the show. Yeah, yeah, for he's sure. a good storyteller. Sure. And for the drag race, I want to I want to go see Victor Bray. You know, I, I, I like Victor, so we'll have to try and see where he's at. See, see where he's at. Go and go and have a look at some of his rigs too. He's got a pretty handy workshop. Yeah. Uh, right, I've got a I've got one here from King Darwin. I don't know that is King King, King, da King Darwin. The King of Darwin. King of Darwin. I don't know. It's a funny Probably take. Darwin, but, but anyway, I don't know. <laughs> um, how good to get uh, the super bikes back on the same bill as um, as supercars. So that was that was pretty cool. I like it. I, I made. I like it. it. Was 2013 was the last time I think we saw the super yeah. bikes with supercars. I reckon that was a great atmosphere. It was a great event. Um, I love the superbike guys. Like they just, I went around, had a bit of a chat with some of them. We we're in an old draft session with the stadium trucks, and the, I was standing next to bike guys, and they just wanted to talk You're about with the cars. Bike guys. I wanted to talk about, yeah, yeah, we were the bike guys. Didn't you go with the supercar guys? No, nah. oh no, super. <laughs> The supercar guys were over here, right? We, we were like plebs down in the back, down in the corner. So I think they were up a couple of levels too. So we were just Good. down, just Good. plebs, mate. But that's all right. That's too, we were the cool kids. Did you have? This, I'm off topic here, but was the yeah. autograph session good with plenty of people? Yeah, yeah. Came was, to see it? Yeah, no, it was good. I think most people were around us, so. Good. That was good, mate. So. Plenty of Enforcer fans still out there. Plenty of Enforcer fans, mate. That's plenty good, of Shea fans there too. That's all I'm talking about, it's a Shea. Have you got merch coming for Bathurst? Like, I think we have. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, no, okay. no, I've got something. Put me down for one of those got, got something, got, mate, I've got, you, I've got you one, so no, no problems. I, um, yeah, so great to see the super bikes. Uh, good, in, great entertainment. Uh, trick bikes. I went down and had a look at the bikes, and geez, I've come so so far since I've had a good close look at a super bike. Good cruise at run out. Riders are really approachable. Just I, I hope they they become a permanent fixture and more events mixed in with supercars. So it's going to be great. Yeah, and they used to be household names, really. Super bike riders in Australia, and yep. if we can get more two by four meetings and. Get, get those guys involved. It, there was a, definitely a lot of crowd there to see the bikes. Oh, massive amount, yeah. massive amount. Like they had, you know, and I, and I saw the fans all around there. They're always around having a look, you know. So it was quite good. Big shunt. Yeah, Herfoss had yeah. left off, and he, I think he actually went under the airbag and then got to the fence. So um, yeah, it was a big one. Lucky he's okay. He's yeah. a fair fair bit of uh, Meccano set in his leg now, holding him together. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it wasn't looking good there for a while, but uh, he'll be all right. Yeah, well, it shows you how dangerous. I mean, I I, um, I went down with uh, with Paul Fenny, Brockstad, who, yeah. was a, who was a bloody handy motorbike rider. And so we um, for practice session on Friday, we went down the end of the straight and we're sort of standing there watching these things under braking. I'm going, man, these dudes are crazy, like serious speed and hard on the brakes. And it's just so cool because the good thing about the Darwin Circuit is you can get pretty close to the track and just seeing them come in under brakes. Just awesome. I think what is good, and if you look at where um, the, the braking distance is so long because you only got two tyres yep, on the track, yep, right? Yep, You've yep, got half yep. the rubber on the track, so the braking distance is uh, there so you can actually you know, get some overtaking. So if you, we can probably learn a bit from that, Yeah. lengthening the braking distance on supercars. It's called downforce. Downforce and... Uh, Pretty easy. And not making the tyres is good. Yep, exactly right. Yeah. Uh, what do you got, dude? Uh, okay. This is from Danny Holden. Yep. Do categories like supercars run for prize money based on results? Or is it similar to F1 with system breaking down the money? Um, yeah, so basically if you've got a wreck, a racing entitlements contract, everyone gets the same amount of money. There's, there's a couple hundred grand of prize money for Bathurst, um, but um, depends how successful the company is. As you said, the wreck money used to be up to a million bucks. Now it's about 500 bucks, 500,000 a car. Whether you're first or last, you get the same dough. So that, that's how that works. It's basically turn up money. There's another question here from Parry. Oh, sorry, Parry, you've got a long name here. Uh, Hatsamina Canis. Yep. Hope I said that right, but anyway. Um, why not just adopt, uh, adopt GT4 rules? Uh, larger range of cars, running costs would be lower, uh, people can relate to it. Well, well, funny enough, I had a segment on this, I remember last year, and, and we never ran it, and I had it sitting in the wings to run, and I had all the breakdowns of the GT4, but then the whole Gen 3 thing started, so I thought, oh, look, I'll park that up. But um, Parry, I asked the same thing, because the GT4 cars, to me, are like the supercars used to be. Not quite as fast, but they could be because you could wind the wick up a little bit on them. Um, whereas they are more 
production based. Uh, they, uh, the costs are cheaper. I remember looking at, I think it was the 2019 or 2020 championship winning GT4 from the European GT4 championship. And it was for sale for 130,000 euro, ready to roll. Yeah. You know, so cheap cars, uh, cheap to run. Um, I was looking at that one of Tony Longhurst, he won the t uh, 12 hour in. Um, costs are very minimal in the yeah. things and that. Yes, they aren't as fast and they aren't as loud and all the rest of it, but they are. It, it's sort of in between what a supercar used to be and a production cars back in the early days, I suppose, but probably. Probably not exciting enough, I don't think. I think so. What, that. What's a GT4 car, a really good one? Might do a 16, a 15, or a 16 uh, around Bathurst. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, and, and boring to watch, you know? Yeah. I they basically so. just invented them for blokes who couldn't drive GT3s. Just slow them down a bit. Slow them down, yeah. yeah. So, I, I, I sort of get it, but there's not enough grunt. You know, the, the engines aren't, and look, like I said, they're restricted as well. So you can wind them all up, but then I think you get probably start getting reliability problems, balance, performance of balance between all the makes and that. Yeah. But I, I think there's a, I think there's something there, you know, it's, it's almost, to me, that's almost a category between TCR and supercars. We don't, we don't need it. Nice. Okay. No, you probably don't need it. So yeah, it presents another, another scope yeah. of problems. Uh, so. The other thing I think with the GT4 car, like, the, this car here has evolved because of all the circuits we run at. Yep. You know, it's got to do street tracks. It's got to go to Bathurst. Yeah, good point. Yeah. You know, it cops and it cops are hiding. Um, I just don't think that those those cars would cop what we give them. No, no, they wouldn't. They're still yeah. pretty. You know, well, the suspension is still pretty road. Yeah. Base. So, you know, as good as they are, yeah, I don't think. Uh, uh, I don't think they'd do with it. Um, you got anything, dude? What do you got? Yeah. Okay. Oh, that one got covered off. Okay, this one here, yeah. it's, this is in the headlines from Stuart Masters, and okay. it's uh, thoughts on the breakdown of the sale of Queensland Raceway to, to Tony uh, Quinn. So, cool. Yeah, that didn't, end, that didn't end up well. I was reading an article there where Tony's had a bit of a, he wasn't happy about it. No, so he's, I, I think what's happened, and uh, I haven't spoken to either of those guys, they're both friends of mine at, uh, in depth, but I think they'd agreed on terms, and then when it come to cementing the deal, it, it didn't go through. Um, Tony had come out, he was on Speed Cafe and said he was, yep. he was pretty upset and disappointed about mm. it. I know he had some great, great plans for what he was going to do. So, but it's broken down for whatever reason. Um, John Tetley will do what he wants to do with it. But the big difference here is I think, you know, John runs his own sanctioning body, which is races. Yep. Um, and it's got a big foothold in South East Queensland. They sanctioned the Noosa Hill Climb on the weekend, which mm -hmm. is a great event. So... Uh, for grassroots racing, uh, he does a great job at sanctioning those events and getting people involved in motor racing. But there's there's our two key tracks in southeast Queensland which don't hold any motorsport Australia affiliated mm. events. So I think when that that'll be the the thing that is not you know ideal for people that need to race on that sanctioning body. Yep. So yeah, it's a shame. It's a shame because it's. You know, it, it's you can almost look at that as a um, like a Sydney motorsport park where they've got you know the drags and you know eventually I think they're getting a speedway out there. Yeah, and, and well, that, that's an ideal, they're, they're an ideal place to put one, isn't it? Yeah, eventually, it massive. It can be such a hub there, but it needs money to do it. At the end of the day, you can't get away from that. You yeah, but John's need, come you, out and said he's going to reinvest. So let's see what that yeah. that that plan looks like. But to like. do it properly, you need big money. You need investors. You need to really have a big swing at it. You do. You don't want to do it over the next decade. No, you, know, no, you, want, it, you want to get in and get it done. That would be the ideal situation: is come in and knock her over and build what you need to build yeah, and get yeah. it up, get it back into shape. Yeah. But yeah, the basis is there. I mean, it's the ideal spot for it. It's going to be. A, it's not going to be a colder. It's going to be. Even though it's, it is building out there, it's going to take a long while before you got the air base there. So they're not going to build too. No, they can't encroach because it's, yeah. it's in that military airspace, which exactly right. is uh, similar to Darwin as well. Yep, yep. The track up there is in. So that, it's an ideal place. It's an ideal place yep. for a massive motorsport hub, but you can't do it without cubic dollars. At the end of the day, so yeah, so it's yeah, it's a, it's a shame, but I, I hope something happens with it because. You know, permanent circuits are fading, not not building. Yeah. Well, the key for me, it's what happens to the grassroots club motorsport guy. How's their life going to change? Is it you know, we'll all survive. People will drive out to Warwick, but um, 
Yeah, well, we should get John on and ask him what his plans are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. sounds good. Hey, uh, probably our last one um, is from Shane Fry 93 says, hey, Rusty, curious to see if yourself or do you simulate as you get practice where you can. Um, I wonder if it's an interesting tool, uh, especially the past 18 months with this pandemic and all the rest of it. So, um, yes. Uh, funny enough, I was talking to Shane Van Gisberg about this. He is probably used as a simulator the most out of anyone. Apparently, he's got a pretty handy because I was actually what, trying to nudge him to an offer to come and use it, but he didn't. Oh. He, he didn't get it, so <laughs> I'll, I'll keep trying because apparently he's got like the full, real deal set up. Uh, I did ask him about it. I, I haven't used one. The last one I used was those hyper simulators. Oh, back, back, in the day. back in the day, like they were the first simulator out, but they're really, really basic. And I just used it. You couldn't get a feel of anything. I just used to use it for concentration, line and length. Funny enough, when I asked Shane about it, he said exactly the same thing. He said, look, no, it doesn't relate to the real thing. You don't get feedback, enough feedback. You don't get the feel. You don't get undulations in the road. You know, if there's a bit of dirt on the road or something, gravel. Uh, but he said what it does give you is concentration and consistency. Yep, hitting the same that. mark, hitting the same lap time. Um, you know, you still got to be smooth with it. You still get, I think, a lot of the new programs now. You still get tired egg, that sort of thing. So maybe, maybe that's why he's so good at it because he spends so much time in the simulator. Could be throttle application, brake, all the rest of it. So, uh, so he uses it a lot. But saying that, Triple Eight have actually got a simulator, and I was talking to Brock Finney the other day. And they're just about to reset theirs up in the new workshop. So okay. we're going to go up and do a bit there. So maybe we should. Do Take one of our fine camera crew oh, up with us. Bush has got a real big, good one at my place. Has he? Yeah, he's on it every night. Yeah, it's they're, they're yeah. good things. So we'll take it. We'll take it for um, when we go up there, and we'll do a bit of a tour of simulator, and, and we'll let you know what it's all about. Because no, I haven't been on one of the latest ones, but they're pretty cool. They're pretty cool. But yes, I think I think for line and length, but nothing beats getting in a car at the end of the day. So that's it, um, mate. I reckon we've used up our hour, dude. Okay. Uh, got through a fair bit. Uh, interesting stuff. There's been a lot of juicy stuff kicking around. That's why I want to get back in the studio because there's plenty of plenty of rumours and change going on. And plenty happening, mate. Good to be part Good of it. Catch up. Yeah. The, so yeah. Back in the bar. Uh, where do I send my um, resume to? Just for media for super. Oh, yeah. the oh. ticketing. No, no. My resume to be you know head of media for supercars when when you get ownership. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, just oh, the same. Oh, no, I just, I just got to sit. Hypothetically, here. if that I, did happen, Russ, you'd yeah, probably be the I just first bloke we call. I just got to sit in here, mate. I just got my resume here. You know, like yeah, you know. We're aware of your yeah. abilities. Oh, oh, okay, all right, yeah. thanks, mate. I just got to sit. And just anyway, I'll just keep it here. Just give me a yell when I, I throw it in the airbag or something. Hey, um, you got a life message? Uh, I do, mate. I do. Yeah. Uh, Fire. You can never make an appointment for a crisis. Okay. <laughs> Is that relating to anything to do with disease, virus? It's anything, mate. It's just, or, just, just or, when you think everything's or, going right, it can or go... motorsport businesses. It, it can go wrong. So. <laughs> or motorsport business, okay. So that's broad. That's broad. That's broad. Yeah, okay. But one thing I have learned out of all this is you never know what's coming, do you? No, no, no. She's... She's, She's going to be prepared about. for anything at, uh, at the moment. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. All right, uh, we'll press on. Um, plenty more racing coming up. And... Uh, We'll uh, we'll bring you another show in the next couple of weeks, and, and we'll bring and, uh, you, and we'll get that um, rest of that uh, SBR championship uh, winning re restoration as driven by Russell Ingle. That's it, brother. And I asked Ross, and he said he's still got the offer to actually go to Ipswich and have a steer when it's finished. Right, you might we'll do merch around that. Huh? You should do merch around that. We like should. A retro we, well, we should make it a we make, should make it a full show out there. Yeah, invite people out. We'll do a show out there with people. That'd be a good idea, wouldn't it? I reckon it'd be bloody good. Yeah, we'd okay. have that, that in the background. We'd do it on the straight. Sell the T-shirts. Yeah. Well, we know the owner, John Tetley, so <laughs> we can make a sure would yeah. Yeah, set it up for us. Yeah. Um, that'd be pretty cool. And and he said if the Pertec car's still around, we might even get that out. So we should get Ambrose over. He can drive the Pertec car. I reckon he'd do it. He'd do anything for a dollar, but I think That's, he'd do it. Yeah, I think he'd do it for Ross and Jimmy. I think, yeah, that'd be pretty I think, special. I think, I think he owes him a that's couple. That's a good one, mate. Yeah, so, so yeah, that'll, that'll be really cool. So, uh, yeah, that's, that'll be towards the end of the year. So, uh, all good. Thanks, all right, guys. Mate. Thanks for coming back. We will see you soon. Ciao.